Uh, it is really my honor to be here again. I first spoke to uh, the first cohort in 2019 when I was uh, Deputy Defence Minister and subsequently uh, as Opposition and now as Deputy uh, Minister of Investment, Trade and Industry. Just now, Dr. Nizam asked me what's the difference between Deputy Minister of Defence and Deputy Minister of Trade. Uh, I say maybe to a certain extent, the post of Deputy Defence Minister is a bit of uh, the Foreign Minister with a gun. Uh, and uh, Miti, maybe the Foreign Minister with the money. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have money. And it, just now, the uh, first Amira talked about golf. This one that I won't, I won't ever tell outside. I was... Uh, I mean, the, the, the rumours circulated that I will be Deputy Defence Minister by about late June 2018, where I was officially appointed on the 17th of July. Uh, so, Tan Sri ZZA, the then new PAT, invited me to uh, a private tea. And two things he, I remember from that. First thing was he gave me Samuel Huntington's The Soldiers and the Stick which I'm going to, I have a new copy to give it to the new Secretary General of uh, MINDEF this afternoon. <laughs> because the news, new MINDEF Secretary General is uh, KSU, is actually uh, the current MITIS KSU. So I'll give him Huntington's book, which I thought uh, is, a, is a very precious gift. Uh, quite an interesting book, so that to, to help us to understand the relationship between soldiers, the soldiers and the state, uh, civil defence relationship, as well as also uh, uh, the the idea that man machine method uh, is important. How important it is. The second thing that Tanshi Sekseki told me, which I thought very interesting, he say, "You know why we play golf? Because it is only on the golf course we can talk secret." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this will, I would, this won't go out. <laughs> uh, I'm also very glad that this course has come to a stage where there is already a civilian attending this course. Uh, <coughs> congratulations. And as well as also uh, foreign participants. This is really good. Uh, as uh, if, you for, if you read what I've previously written about this college, I really hope that this will be a bit like Lemhana's and also other defense uh, institutions where you have civilian attending and you also have uh, other foreign participants attending. So this is really good. Um, and I hope that uh, more civilian leaders, uh, maybe at least a civil servant and eventually maybe some uh, corporate leaders will also be participants of uh, this course. And in any way you need an advocate, let me know. I will open my big mouth and say more <laughs> on this. Uh, because it's important to foster a civil military relationship that is, uh, that is built upon common understanding. I think the challenge for this country is we have too many silos even within the armed forces, there are silos, not to mention within, uh, between ministries and also uh, uh, between, uh, yeah, between services, between ministries. Everyone is seeing from their own perspective, perspective. But what we need is a common understanding. So if the more common understanding we have among ourselves as a nation, the better we are in, uh, to, to navigate the challenges that we are going to face. Um, one of the points that, uh, let me begin by also talking about the needs for defence civilian. Apart from common understanding between the armed forces and the civilian, it is also important for us to build up a strong uh, defence civilian. We do not have that in the sense that we have a system where we rotate civil servants from different ministries, but we do not build up a strong subject matters uh, what they call institutional memory within the defence ministry. If you look at Pentagon, if you look at uh, the Australian Defence uh, um, Department and many other defence ministry, most of the defence civilians stay in defence ministry for the entire of their career. And I think that is very important. We need more of uh, subject matter expert within among the defence civilian so that we can build a strong understanding within the Defence Ministry. Uh, I recommend to you a book by Ash Carter, the late uh, former Defence Secretary of the United States during Obama's time. 
the, his memoir is called Inside the Five-Sided Box, which he talks about the, how the F-35 was built, and it was actually a, a failed, almost a failed project, and eventually he rescued it. And of course, also about controversies about the LCS in the, in the US, not in Malaysia, as well as controversies about expensive toilet seats. Uh, but toilet seats was too expensive and he was grilled, grilled by the Senate. But the, the point is that uh, Ash Carter was one of the very few defense secretary who rose from procurement all the way up. Usually defense secretary were from, uh, from among politicians and also businessmen as well as a, a strategic thinker. But very few are like Ash Carter who rose from the bottom to become a defense secretary. And his stories about procurement, his story about how defense civilian play a role in thinking through, thinking through uh, procurement, thinking through industry, thinking through how all these dotted are linked, uh, is really uh, an eye opener for me. And I hope some of you would, would take up a challenge to read it. Um, originally, Major General uh, Abdul Rahman invited me to speak on Malaysia's national security and strategic industrial base. I wanted to broaden it up, broaden, broaden it to Malaysia's economic security in the era of geopolitical uncertainties because I thought that would provide a larger and more comprehensive understanding. But I'm uh, ready to take questions later on various subjects on industry. Broadly, I think we are living in a very difficult yet interesting time. It is a time of flux, and if we reflect on the history of, night, of, of the night, uh, of the twentieth century, we are probably like around the uh, living around the time of nineteen fourteen to nineteen eighteen, about nineteen thirty nine to nineteen forty five, probably about nineteen sixty eight to about nineteen seventy six. Nineteen sixty eight, there was an uprising in France. There were Uprise, there were demonstrations in the United States, there was Vietnam War, and then subsequently there was a, a US pulling out from Bretton Woods, uh, the rapprochement with China, US rapprochement with China, and multiple challenges in a time of flux, and of course uh, the oil crisis and, and uh, the Israel-Arab War. So that period of time was also actually a very challenging time where major decisions were made and it had consequences for the next 50 years, of, of which the US-China rapprochement uh, could be counted as a major shift, as well as US pulling out from the Bretton Woods was also another major shift with had, which had consequences over the next five decades. Then we are also probably in a time of between 1989 and 1992, when uh, the Berlin Wall fell and until uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union at, uh, at the end of 1991. So we are now in a situation where decisions we make, wittingly or unwittingly, may have consequences for the years and years and years to come. Because the old order has strayed, the new order hasn't emerged yet. And from a geopolitical standpoint, we are now living in the post-post-post-Cold post, post, post War. Between 1991-92 until probably around COVID, we could call it a period of time. A period of about 30 years where, uh, if you look back, we can say that broadly, the initial period was US dominance, and subsequently, it was uh, uh, the order fraying. And Broadly, the economically, we could identify those periods as the hyper-globalization period. But now, we are in a new time. Over that period of time, in economics discourse, since Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, since the Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher revolution from around 1980s, the world has been preoccupied or the world was preoccupied with the idea of economic efficiency. Why I talk about economic efficiency? Because I want to contrast it with economic security later. 
for a period of about 40 years since the early 80s, the logic of economic efficiency trumped everything. Uh, every idea when it was discussed is whether it is economically efficient or not. And everything else was relegated to secondary or non-existence. Example, in education, the intrinsic value of educating a person was no longer seen as important. The inherent value of having a good people in order to form good society was not given importance. What was given importance was to educate enough workforce, enough people to work for global capital. And during that period of time, the idea of providing education by the government was no longer seen as important. We moved to user pay. And in the Malaysian context, it was about borrowing from PTPTN in order to study. To the extent that I recently found out that if you want to study TVAC, technical education, uh, many of them have to borrow from a fund called PTPTK in order to borrow to study TVAC, technical education. So those periods of time, economic efficiency, uh, user pay was the main idea. Another example, in Malaysia, we call our labor ministry human resource ministry. We have no longer seen labor as an important value. Uh, and empowering labor is no longer a, a value, or it has never been a major value that we hold to. But we have somehow seen ourselves as, uh, as a government, as a government, we have, we have somehow given the government an idea that the government is to find workers for cooperation. So we acted as if we are the HR department of the private sector. In reality, and actually for a, a better society, the government should act as a referee rather than acting as if it is a HR department of the private sector. And that is something that we will have to rethink. Uh, because that whole period of time thinking that corporation is king uh, and everyone else serving them. And the idea that corporation create all the values, therefore we have to serve them, I think that is now being questioned. So I, there's one book that you may be interested in which has guided uh, the, the, the what they call New Industrial Master Plan a lot, which is uh, by Mariana Mazzucato. Mission Economy by, by Mariana Mazzucato. The idea that she talked about is that we must revisit the idea that corporations is king and corporation brings innovation that, and that the state has no, no involvement in creating value. In many ways, the state helps create values. Particularly if you go back to look at some of the major innovations in the world, uh, including the internet, GPS, uh, and many other technology. It has a lot to do with U.S. military spending and U.S. <coughs> military research and development. Because of DIPRA, because of uh, the, the mission to put people on, on the moon, uh, moonshot, and because of all other research in order to, in order to strengthen the U.S. military that resulted in a lot of innovation that we are using as civilian technologies now. So it's important for us to rethink the role of corporations, the role of the state, and to find a new balance. Globally, the hyper-globalization hyper period also coincided with the following phenomena. Number one, the containerization of shipping. Now today we think about shipping, we think about containers. But that wasn't the case 60 years ago. Containers only became more widespread in the 1970s and became dominant only in the late 80s and 1990s onwards. So this is actually not very new. And not, I mean, this is actually not ancient. Containerization is new, at least it is not more than containerization as the only form and only mode of transport or the predominant mode of transport is not more than 50 years around the globe. 
Now, because container has become so easy, corporations think about moving boxes as if there's no, no restriction, no barrier. And boxes are moved, therefore, it, factories are placed in different places as corporation wishes, and they went for the cheapest production site. So a car that is assembled in Thailand may have components coming from 50 countries. Because during that period of time, especially after the fall of Berlin Wall, uh, the end of the Cold War, it was deemed very easy to move boxes. The world has no barrier. And therefore, with the end of the, old, the Cold War and the opening of China and Eastern Europe, corporations prioritize cheap production sites. Corporations are thinking about going to the cheapest place to produce. And also because uh, in the United States, in UK, and many other advanced countries, the union will actually already been busted by Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. So the West has no longer had strong unions. Jobs have been outsourced to various parts of the world. And then with China opening up and Eastern Europe, opening up, uh, as well as containerization. Production site were widespread and wages around the world were kept low. And of course, the, the other characterization of this hyper-globalization period, the period between 19, 1989 to around COVID, is the financialization of the global economy. The end of Bretton Woods remove any barrier for check and balance as far as currency and finances is concerned. And that also resulted in widespread of multiple financial products and the emergence of financial centre like New York, London, Singapore and Hong Kong. Singapore and Hong Kong are city-states or city, city jurisdiction. They, they are financial centres but they did not need to have a hinterland. And during the hyper-globalization period, especially from 2001 when China joined WTO, a lot of production happened in China, and say for example Singapore was the financial center, uh, they, do not need the need, they did not need the hinterland during those periods of time. And Hong Kong was touted as the Passion of economic liberalism by Milton Friedman from around the 1970s because the government doesn't do anything for the people. It was a small city state, taxes were low, and Singapore and Hong Kong went into a comp tax competition to reduce taxes. And all of us were affected in the sense that we were trying to compete to lower taxes uh, and setting Hong Kong and Singapore as the benchmark. So those were the characteristics of those periods of time. Is it going to continue? I think this is a period where this, all this will reverse, including because Hong Kong, both Hong Kong and Singapore has an aging population. Without taxing the population, without providing, without having enough revenue to pay for healthcare and aged care, it will be difficult for these states. I suggest there's a book called uh, Crack Up Capitalism, by Queen Slobdian to talk about the tax cut race to, tax, race to the bo bottom through tax cut by this, uh, this uh, enclave. And I, I, will send, I will give you the, what they call, the, the titles later. This is something that I, I also recommend, which is an interesting book to read. And this whole idea of not having to tax many people uh, and uh, this idea of having low taxes Behind it is this idea that you don't need a state. There's no need for a state. The state is only a night watchman state. Now, if there's no need for a state, there's no need for armed forces. Right? So the idea, idea during that period of time is that everything else is not important. The only important uh, organization in the society was the corporation. But that era is ending. Because even before COVID, Brexit in 2016 and the election of Trump in 2016 was already a revolt by those left behind 
in this hyper-globalization period. It was a response, it was a pushback. And now we are seeing a lot more challenges that required a new mind frame, a new organizational principle, and a new idea to how to organize things. What are we facing now? Number one, COVID-19 and put the potential of future pandemic as well as an aging society tells us that we need to invest a lot more in healthcare and in general uh, security of the people. Number two, geopolitical tension and the war in Ukraine also educated us that the idea that security has no place in our consideration is now coming back to haunt us. Number three, the financial instability that is continuing to, uh, to cause havoc is something that we have to think through. Uh, the world faced the global financial crisis, and of course, before the global financial crisis, Malaysia experienced the Asia financial crisis in 1997. We are now facing, now we are seeing the tail end of inflation, global inflation. But the last year or so, we experienced serious global inflation uh, that has huge consequences on our economy as well as the economy around the globe. And the inflation was caused by the war in Ukraine as well as the disruption and post-COVID disruption, the sudden surge of demand, as well as uh, what they call disruption in logistics. But now we are dealing with a high interest rate environment. After almost a decade of low interest rate environment, the world is now dealing with a high interest rate environment. A high interest rate environment will present a new set of consequences and challenges to all government, including, for example, the government of Malaysia, which actually has a, a significant amount of debt that we have to service. And the fourth major challenge is climate change. Climate change is real and it has real consequences. So I give you an example, the current crisis about rice. The current crisis about rice is a combination of the factors we have outlined earlier. Because of the war in Ukraine, feedstock, fertilizer, and a lot of other inputs, agriculture input has, I mean, the prices have skyrocketed. And because of climate challenges, India had a, a couple of seasons where they did not have sufficient yield in rice. And of course, Malaysia's heavy dependence on import uh, comes into play. So it's a combination of climate, our financial model, where it, we, we mostly import, as well as the war in Ukraine that resulted in the rice crisis that we are feeling now. And there are so many other examples that point to us that we need to move away from the framework of economic efficiency or at least balance it with economic security. At least balance it with, with, with the idea of economic security so that we are no longer just thinking about economic efficiency. Anyway, as we enter into the new phase, to use the most simple way of explaining is we move away from an ethos of just in time to just in case. If, if, if you are familiar with the jargon, in, in production, for many years, factories think that they can move boxes, move containers everywhere from around the world, and they can do it just in time. They do not need redundancy. They do not need any, any extra, extra stockpile. They think that they can move things as they wish. But today, the ethos or today the theme that the password is just in case. Because after the disruptions that we experienced over the last few years, finally, people get it. We, economic efficiency is not everything. Economic security is also important. 
I would like to bring you to three dimensions of economic security, and then I will end the, the lecture and we can go into discussions. The first dimension is the domestic dimension. I call it governing for the precariat. This is a major challenge everywhere domestically, including in the United States, but also particularly salient in Malaysia. I visited Detroit this May and had attended the APEC ministerial meeting as well as uh, what they call um, IPEF, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework ministerial meeting. And in that meetings, as well as private conversation with US officials, particularly uh, US Trade Representative Catherine Tai and also uh, Secretary of Commerce Gina Romando. I told them I understand the new idea of the Biden administration. The Biden administration has been negotiating trade negotiation with all of us. However, there is not going to be free trade ag agreement that brings uh, low ring of tariff as well as uh, market access. So within Southeast Asian countries, we say, why, why is there no FTA? Why is there no, uh, no market access? Why is there no tariff reduction? But I understand where they are coming from. They are now very focused and very worried about losing jobs and they want to sustain a middle class in the United States. Now, the sustainer of a middle class in, in the United States has global consequences. Because when we now think about the potential return of Trump and the foreign policy that the Trump administration is going to carry, uh, we get very nervous. And therefore, it has never been so important that the United States sustain a middle class. But I also told them, much as I understand that, I also want to build a middle class in my home. I want to build a middle class in Malaysia. I want to see a middle class in Indonesia. I want to see a middle class in Thailand. I, I want to see a middle class in the Philippines. And that is where globally, whether the United States or Malaysia or Indonesia or Thailand, we have to deal with the same challenge. How do we actually ensure that there is going to be a middle class among our society to sustain a strong and stable, stable society? Over the last few years in Malaysia, we talk about political instability because of changes of coalitions and because of a, a political coup, da, da, da. but actually, all of us are invested in a stable society. Whether polit politicians come and go, however, we need to ensure that the society is stable. And the fundamental sustainment of a society is through a strong middle class. When you have a strong middle class, when you have many Malaysians who are not worried about the next meal, we will have a very strong society. The stability of a society is to invest and to ensure that there is a strong middle class. So where are we now? According to employee wages statistics, former sector report by Department of Statistics for the first quarter of 2023. This is a series of figures, which I hope I don't bore you. We have a labor force of 16.02 million. The total labor force is 16.02 million, of which 15.38 million are employed. That means there is a small unemployment, uh, a small group of people who are unemployed, which is acceptable. And of which 12 million are paid worker. And of which uh, and 12, 12 million are paid worker and another 2.8 million self-employed, another 487,000 who are unpaid family workers, and uh, 532,000 employers. Of the 12 million paid workers, 
10.5 million are citizens. That means the rest are non-citizens. But we also know that there are many non-citizens who are not legally documented. Of the 10.5 million citizens, 61% are employed in former sector. That means that the other 38% are em employ employed in informal sector, particularly gig works. Of the 34% Malaysians who are formally employed in the former sector, 34% earn less than 2,000 ringgit a month. 80% of those 6 million people who are formally employed, that means 80% of people who, who has a formal employment, earn less than 5,500. Okay? 80% earn less than 5,500 a month. And the medium wage in 2021 was 2,250 ringgit. So the last annually available data uh, for medium wage was in 2021. We are going to get the medium wage for 2022 by October this year. What does that, what does that mean? That means, what is medium wage? Medium wage means 50% of the population who are working, they are earning a wage less than 2,250 ringgit. That means, however hard they work, full-time job, they are only earning less than 2,250 ringgit, 50% of them. Okay? So we are in a situation where most people who work are not earning enough, whether they are privately working or whether they, uh, I mean, whether they are working as a, as a self-employed, whether they are working as a gig workers, whether they are working in the formal sector, we have a low wage, low productivity, uh, low, low cost situation. And this is a long-term security challenge. I call this a precarious economy. Our economy is precarious. There, there is a huge number of people, there, there are a huge number of people who are living precariously. And we call them the precariat. How to govern for them, how to ensure that over the next 10 years, they, their income grow and they become a middle class and we no longer have a triangle society where, or pyramid society where the bottom is huge, the middle is small, the top is small. This is a major challenge, which is why Prime Minister Dr. Sri Anwar Ibrahim mentioned or spelled out in Economy Madani, in his speech on Economy Madani, to ensure that we have higher growth higher wages, and uh, a middle-class society. That is a challenge that we have to deal with. The second dimension is geo-economics. Second dimension of economic security is geo-economics. The years to come, the years to come will be defined by US-China rivalry. I think we can foresee that the next 5, 10, 15 years, Maybe more than 15 years, we may not be able to tell. But the next 5, 10, 15 years, the world will be characterized by US-China rivalry and how we navigate it. The buzzword now in, in, in what I do in MITI and in, the, in our relationship, our engagement with industry, with everyone, is supply chain reorganization. There used to be a period of time, as I say, container boxes will move everywhere. But now, the priority of cooperation is to ensure a shorter and more secure supply chain. They do not want boxes flying everywhere. They want to see that, okay, we, I built a factory here. I, I want to find supply in Indonesia, in Vietnam, in Thailand, and not from Mexico. So we are moving into a situation where supply chain becomes the password for everyone. And this is important. This is maybe Malaysia's, Malaysia's opportunity as well. Malaysia's residue as well. In the sense that because for the longest of time, especially since China joined WTO in 2001 until COVID, 
most of the investment into manufacturing went into China. And Malaysia suffered a long period of premature deindustrialization. Now we see massive investment coming in uh, because of supply chain reorganization. So this is where we have there, there's potential for Malaysia and there's potential for Malaysia to have a second economic takeoff because of the huge investment coming in. But of course, that is premised on a very precarious situation that there's no war in the South China Sea, there's no war in the Taiwan Straits, there's peace in the region. Jack Sullivan, the US uh, National Security Advisor, in his speech in April, in this April to the Brookings Institu Institution, spelled out that the US policy is to create high fences, but within a small yard. His idea is that US-China competition is not a decoupling process, but a process in which US will try to protect and restrict the spread of its highest end technology, but will confine it with a smaller uh, frame or smaller scope. And the buzzword this year, or the consensus this year, is called the risking. Because for an extended period since Trump, the word decoupling has been talked about for many years, for at least five years. Now, Europe, US, and in general, the buzzword, the agreement or the consensus is de-risking. To interpret de-risking, I put it in the most simplest explanation, the simplest explanation, Essentially, it is not putting all the manufacturing eggs in one China basket. Okay? Moving some of the manufacturing capacity outside China in order that there's anything happen between US and China or Europe and China, there are other manufacturing capacity outside China. But this is on the premise. What Jack Sullivan say, what the emerging consensus of the risking say, is premised on this understanding that the US and Europe, European technology will forever be higher than China, which is still a, an, an assumption that can be proven wrong in the years to come. And this is something that we will have to deal with because we are at the, at the crossroad where in all senses, Malaysia is in all senses at the crossroad in the middle between this crossfire. We are geographically, strategically located and at the same time, we are also having US businesses, European businesses and Chinese businesses. We can be a meeting point but we can also be a trouble spot. And that's where we have to think through and we have to be vigilant and we also have to be able to be flexible enough, nimble enough in navigating uh, US-China rivalry. And at the heart of all this, I'm going to give a, uh, give a gift to National Resilient College later. It's a book titled Chip War. I don't know any of you, any one of you have read it, but uh, this is a gift to the to uh, MKN. At the heart of all this is semiconductor, this chip war, and we happen to be Malaysia happens to be one of the ten nations in the world that has a substantial presence in global manufacturing of chip. Although most of our work is in the back end, we we specialize mostly on testing and assembling, but still, we have significant role to play in the global semiconductor trade. Malaysia semiconductor trade constitutes uh, US total semiconductor trade. We are about 23% of US total semiconductor trade. Malaysia constitutes about 5% of global semiconductor trade. 
And this is where Malaysia, if we do not manage geopolitics well, uh, we may be a contested site. And this is this call upon people like all of you here to be strategic thinkers, to be able to help the nation to navigate and strategize and charge ahead. The final dimension, the third dimension that I want to mention is the Malaysian defense sector in the overall economy. We have a unique situation as, as we know. Unlike other countries in Southeast Asia, the Malaysian armed forces share almost similar presence with the uni uni unified command commanded police force. Unlike other countries in the region, most other countries in the region where the military has a preeminent position in the society, we have a dual system. Very often, defense industry or defense sector is not given its due recognition and, and importance. In 2019, uh, the, the government, the then government presented the defense white paper, of which uh, we, uh, some of us are involved. And within the defense white paper, there were supposed to be three major parts which has to be followed up. One is the defense industry, defense and security industry policy. Okay. Dasa Industri Pertahanan dan Keselamatan Negara, DITKN, uh, which is still not being presented. The other part is to rethink defense capability. The third part is to have a defense capability, a capacity blueprint. I want to touch a bit about defense capability. Uh, some of you who are familiar with my views is that we have multiple service-oriented defense capability plan, but we do not have a unified defense capability plan that is core developed with the treasury and accepted, elevated and given funding sources by the cabinet and by the parliament. And this is where I think we, we were still far, ahead, far behind from our potential. We cannot just have service-oriented defense capability plan, uh, whether it's CAP 55 or uh, 15 to 5. These are service-oriented plans with, without being recognized officially by the Treasury and by the Cabinet and by the Parliament. We cannot have individual service plan forever. All this has to be synchronized. Very hard questions have to be asked. Uh, very diff difficult questions have to be asked and eventually core develop into a long-term plan. We are constrained as a nation by the framework of a five-year plan, Rancangan Malaysia, which is useful for other sectors. But when it comes to defense sector, there needs to be longer horizon and far more than five years. And this is something that I, I think we need to go back to the defense white paper and to develop the capability plan, to develop the defense industry plan, as well as to rethink defense capacity, which also include where I started. In, the, in thinking through the overall defense capacity, as far as defense people is concerned, it shouldn't just be about ATM, it shouldn't just be about the armed forces, it should also be about having long-term thinking about defense civilian, which is very important. And of course, cyber defense is one other concern, and uh, many other concerns, for example, how to deal with the questions of uh, retired veterans, especially those who who are non-commissioned officers who retired very, very young, and how to reorganize reservists. So I want to end with just a few points about defense industry, apart from capacity and capability. Our defense industry are populated by agents. There are many agents in our defense industry. 
but we have not actually built strong defense R&D. You have people from Stripe, which is very good, but we need to think through how to cut across the silos among all ministries and build R&D across the board for dual use. Of course, dual use, the word dual use is a dirty word sometimes. Uh, but dual use is important when we think about de developing a defense industry. It cannot, well, we cannot just develop for the armed forces. There must be some dual use and also uh, usage across ministry, across the security sector, and also into the civilian sector. And there's also a recognition that we need to have. That means we are not pursuing full self-sufficiency. We, we will have to be honest with ourselves that we will pursue limited self-sufficiency in areas where we can have the greatest impact. I mean, there was a time where we tried to pursue self-sufficiency everywhere. I think we will have to accept that we pursue self-sufficiency in selected areas, but build the best build the highest level of competency in research and development and to build long-term capacity that we can, we can build upon and we can be proud of. So I think uh, I would like to conclude, conclude and especially the last part, uh, uh, it, it can be food for thought and also a source for many debates later. Uh, I welcome discussions and thank you very much. Thank you for this honor to speak to you for the third time at the National Resilient College. Thank you very much.